A step testing under scrutiny. The statewide test with big implications is under fire and lawmakers want answers for what went wrong causing extensive delays for students. Today we're sitting down with the woman in charge of education in Indiana, Superintendent of Public Instruction Glenda Ritz. She also weighs in on the school safety bill and the expansion of vouchers. Plus our political insiders join us on this edition of Indianapolis This Week. From RTV6, Indianapolis This Week. The state's largest testing system suffered this year, causing major problems for students, teachers, and administrators in Indiana schools. Those issues involve tens of thousands of students knocked offline while trying to take the test. Teachers are concerned about the impact of all the problems and what those will do to student scores. According to teacher contracts, low test scores by their students can be cited for withholding part or all of their negotiated pay raises for the year. State lawmakers are demanding answers from the company that administered the I-STEP test that had so many issues this spring, and they have scheduled a hearing for early June to address the problems. How the problems occurred, why they were uh, not prepared for those problems, what they're doing about it to assure that these problems don't arise in the future. And joining us now is State Superintendent Glenda Ritz. Uh, before being elected to her office, Superintendent of Public Instruction Ritz served as president of the Washington Township Education Association for 15 years and has taught at all three levels of public schools in Indiana from elementary through high school. Uh, Mrs. Ritz, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, well, you're welcome. All right. Um, I step testing. Boy, what a mess this year. It was. <laughs> what, what are we going to do about that, first of all, or what should the state do? Uh, the state legislators want to talk about it, obviously. What should they be doing? Well, they're, first of all, I think the state of Indiana <clears throat> has gotten itself into what we call very high-stakes testing. And so one test given at the end of the school year is not only tied to school accountability and the grades that they're assigned, but to teacher evaluation and also uh, in part in their comp in compensation, uh, depending upon the rating of the teacher. And so as a result, um, the issues that we had uh, with the online assessment um, have to be looked at very carefully. So we're hiring a third party to actually, actually review the scores of the students that had interruptions. Uh, we're getting ready to start that process and um, begin looking at uh, the student scores. That sounds like a long process. Well, it is going to take a few weeks. Um, we're hoping to get it done all in June. So that's our process. Um, we're, we're getting ready to hire. We'll, we'll be announcing soon uh, the, the group that we've hired to actually oversee that process. But we want an independent audit of the scores. So it's an outside group doing it. But do you have any idea? I mean, how do they do that? It, I mean, little Johnny didn't get to take the full test that day and had to spread it over the next week or whatever it was. I mean, how do they evaluate and see, you know, whether those results are true? Well, keep in mind that students were not interrupted every every test session they took. Mm -hmm. uh, students took anywhere from four to six test sessions, totally different test sessions. And so the interruptions occurred, you know, could have occurred, you know, like in one of their test sessions or maybe two of their test sessions. And so we're going to be taking a look at the test sessions themselves, um, looking at students' um, information um, and, and scoring before the interruptions, after the interruptions. Uh, keep in mind, everybody needs to keep in mind, all students have the opportunity to finish their assessments. Okay. So they all finish their assessments. And so we do have complete information for the kids. It's not like they ran out of time. And... No, we no. A, a time was given, expanded. Every student finished every session. Interrupted the school year a little bit, though. I well, mean, it interrupted. Yeah, push oh, back. most definitely. Um, the Department of Education was assisting, really, CTB in the manner. Um, on the second day when we had interruptions, uh, we had about 8% interruptions uh, midday, and I said, we need to stop assessments, and how can we assist you? Um, uh, talking to the vendor, and, and I said, you know, I think we really need to have half the load of students on. So let's do that for a few days until we're to the point where we feel that we're going to be able to have assessments completed. My number one goal at that point was to literally have them completed. You said earlier we got ourselves involved in high stakes testing. Mm -hmm. uh, remind those who don't remember what did we have before the high stakes testing that you're talking about and, and you know who got us to where we are? Well, um, when we first started I-STEP, 
it was for the purpose of student learning. Mm -hmm. And we welcomed that as educators. Uh, we wanted to see how our students were doing and we wanted to have some measure of, of how we were performing with the standards. Um, and it was, it was welcome. And we would use that information to help us prepare for the following years. And it was all about the students. Right. Um, now, it's not all about the students. I mean, we're gonna get information from the students, but the stakes of the test, um, that that one test is used to actually assign accountability and like I said, teacher evaluation. So through le the legislative process, it has become a high stakes test uh, in effect. And um, I, I wish it were just about the learning because if it were, if it had been just about the learning this year, I would have said, CTB, would you please reset the reset those segments and we'll take the test and see how our kids did. So when the testing starts, the students, the teachers, are probably just as nervous as the students because oh. they they have just as much, if not more, on the line. Is Most what you're definitely, saying. yeah. Oh, yeah. They're nervous about it. It's, it's the first year um, that compensation is tied to teacher evaluation, and so yeah, they're they're quite upset uh, as they should be, um, knowing that we're not quite sure what the scores are going to mean. And there's some pressure, some outside pressure, some school administrators saying that these results should be declared invalid. What do you think about that? Well, we're going to go through that process. That's the process we're getting ready to begin. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll, we'll just have to see about the pool of scores that are deemed valid. Keep in mind, not all students were interrupted. Right. Um, you know, we gave over, uh, over almost 500,000 students took the exams. Um, and so we don't we don't have 500,000 worth of students that were interrupted. Right. So there were some school districts that really didn't experience interruptions at all. Others experienced several. So that we just have to look at the information and the data um, and really, you know, take a hard look and determine uh, the scores. And, and I'll reiterate again, all students did complete their test. Right. Um, just how well they did because of the interruption. Oh, yes, um, correct. So, so now the future, CTB, McGraw-Hill, uh, is the contractor for at least another year on this? Uh, we do have a contract for another year, that is true, um, but obviously we have a contract with them now um, mm -hmm. and it will, you know, we're going to begin dialogue also uh, in that arena, uh, damages and talking about, you know, um, if we do have a contract going forward for the next year, what's it going to look like and how we're going to prevent these things and what are you going to put in place? Are you um, looking at outside uh, a second company to administer these tests? We haven't determined any of that yet. Um, we're, we're just beginning the serious dialogue with CTB. Uh, we wanted to be sure that all of the uh, students completed the test. That was the first primary concern. Now we're beginning the validity process uh, with a third party and we're also simultaneously going to be talking with CTB. All right, good. Stick around. We want to have some more topics other than just the, the I-STEP tests. More topics with uh, State Superintendent of Schools, Glenda Ritz, right after this. All right, welcome back. Uh, our guest still, Superintendent of Public Instruction, Glenda Ritz. Um, let's talk vouchers now. The, it, it's really taking off, expanding quite a bit, the voucher uh, system here in, uh, in Indiana. I know you're not a fan. Nope. But uh, where do you see the heading? Well, it, it's just taking more and more money uh, away from public education. Um, and so I have a great concern for that. Uh, however, however, as a superintendent, I have a responsibility to actually implement uh, the voucher system. Um, and I will do that. Um, I have an obligation to follow the law. But uh, I'm, I'm hoping that um, we don't do any more expansions of the voucher. Um, really, we need to, to ha take a hard look about um, how the money's being used in the schools. We have no accountability system in place at all mm -hmm. uh, for the vouchers that are going to the schools and how that's used. And um, I, I really think that we need to take a hard look and, and actually do some evaluation. Governor Pence signed a school safety bill uh, this year and it essentially provides $50,000 for schools to um, reinforce their security system, their school safety systems, um, if they qualify. Uh, is that where we need to be to prevent a new town Connecticut style of shooting down the road? Well, it certainly is a step in the right direction. Uh, we have schools that are in need of school resource officers, and we wanted to be sure to provide that opportunity. Um, but in the state of Indiana, we have a very high-profile safety training program. Uh, we require safety officers uh, in our schools to begin with, um, and we have for several years. We're way ahead of the game um, compared to most states uh, in the nation. And so we have a rigorous training program for the officers um, and a very robust and, and 
and the Department of Education is getting ready to actually do a, a safety institute and really get at the classroom level regarding bullying and issues that that happen within the schools that also um, promote safety within our within within our walls. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna be working on that in a variety of ways. I'm on the governor's committee uh, that's also talking about safety. We have lots of different agencies at the table. So I think uh, I think Indiana is really uh, doing uh, a really good job of making sure that we're going to do the what we can, the utmost importance is keeping our, our kids safe. Um, and right after that situation in Connecticut, schools took action on their own. Uh, even my own school, Crooked Creek Elementary School, when I went back there, um, you know, it was an open concept school. Mm -hmm. You know, doors were put on all of the all of the uh, rooms and so safety precautions and you know and when you enter the front doors now um, the actual halls to the students the doors are closed they're not automatically open um, so precautions were taken right away right. Um, as I as I see in schools all in my travels you know I see a lot of different things that have been taking place to make sure that our our schools are safer when you enter let's talk letter grades they remain for school performances but legislators uh, made some changes in how they're uh, calculated, I guess. Those grades now include both peer performance uh, uh, measures and how test scores have approved. Something you campaigned on, is that right? It is, and it's something that's the one thing I wanted to have happen in the legislative session uh, is to give me the opportunity to work with that um, um, accountability model. So uh, we are going to get a chance to redo the growth portion um, by law now. We cannot use the scores of students and compare them with their peers around the state and estimate their growth. Right. We're actually going to be working from their own student growth information, comparing them to themselves. Uh, and that is more fair for teacher evaluation, accountability for the school. Um, so I'm excited about being able to do that. I plan on reporting out two pieces of information. Um, the percentage of students that actually um, meet the benchmark perform at or above grade level, which is very important. But schools also need to know separately um, this number of students, uh, the percentage of students in their schools that show the same or positive growth. Uh, and they need to know both. A quick example is if we have a low performing school, but they have good growth, we know they're headed in the right direction right. and we want to put more supports in there for them to have work with. But schools could still be getting F's. I mean, the letter grade. Oh, I still have to assign a grade. Mm -hmm. uh, what I don't what I'm not going to do is to somehow marry those two totally different concepts together into a single grade. Uh, what I'm hoping to do is to have cutoffs. Here's the percentage of students that you need to have uh, performing at or above level to be in the A category, and here's the growth that you need to have to be in the A category. So I'm okay. hoping to look at the two separate pieces of information. It's important they be separate, um, but to determine then that here's what you need to be in the A category and so forth. Um, I know you have a lot going on. You don't really get the summer off, right? Like all, all no, those kids and this the is the first year that I'm not going to get the summer off. That's right. Uh, 34 you were years of Creek teaching. For a long yeah, time. 34 years of teaching, and I've always had my summers. You uh, are, are kind of out there pushing the Hoosier Family of Readers uh, program to keep the students reading, right, over the summer? We are, and uh, we're partnering with about 175 different organizations across the state, uh, empowering them to make reading part of what they do this summer. So the United Way just had their kickoff uh, this week and um, to, uh, downtown in Indianapolis. And and making sure that they're going to get people to work with kids this summer for reading. Uh, we've got the girls and boys clubs that have p pledged statewide that in their programs they're going to make d reading uh, part of their daily activities with kids. The YMCA's are going to be doing the same thing as part of their summer camps. Mm -hmm. uh, public libraries, of course. Um, but we have a lot of organizations out there that are just going to make a, a focus for family reading. Students are identifying their family of readers. Uh, it's not necessarily their immediate family. Um, it could be uh, a mentor at their church you know right. it could be a librarian whoever their family of readers is going to be to make sure they read this summer all right glinda ritz superintendent of public instruction always good to have you thank Thanks you for coming by we thank you very it. much all right uh still coming up our political insiders are just minutes away stay with us all right welcome back and joining us now are two of our political insiders democrat kip chu and republican jennifer hallowell welcome Good to be here. Let's talk uh, NSA. Uh, they seem to be scouring our background, especially if you're a Verizon customer and actually the other carriers as well. Um, it's been reported that they have been taking those phone numbers basically uh, to secure our national security. Um, and the Washington Post reporting recently as well that they're tapping directly into internet companies, uh, extracting audio and video chats, all in the name of national security bother you a little bit that the Obama administration is doing this, Jennifer? Well, I think there's there are a lot of interesting things here to talk about. Um, the first is 
that President Obama is supportive of this because when he campaigned for president in 2008, he said that President George W. Bush was providing Americans with a false choice between liberties and security. And then today, in his, uh, or Friday in his press conference, he said, we have choices we have to make and you can't have 100% privacy and 100% security. And so he's, he's clearly um, had a great departure from his campaign in 2008. I think that's interesting. The other thing is, you know, I think this does cut across party lines. There are a lot of people who are really nervous about this, but there are also very respected leaders in both political parties who are adamant that this is important for national security. And so I think it's, you know, finding that balance and, uh, you know, determining is this necessary on this scale you know, or is there another way? And, and it's an important discussion that, you know, we're finally having. President changing his tune a little bit? Well, probably a, a little bit, I would say. Uh, you know, once you're in the office, it's a different ball game than when you're in before the office. But there's a big difference, I think, here with uh, with respect to what George W. Bush did and what this president has done with respect to that. And that that's the procedure between the, uh, before the FISA court, FISA court, which is he went and his NSA went and got uh, subpoenas, if you will, to get those records. The Bush administration bypassed the FISA court, and that was what the big controversy was with the last administration. Certainly, I think it raises very important civil liberty questions, and I think uh, you, when you see the melding of the two parties, it's the civil libertarian streak in both parties that are coming together to criticize this. So you have a lot of liberals, uh, judging by my Twitter feed the last few days, who are completely outraged, and then you also have uh, sort of the Rand Pauls of the Republican Party who are also outraged. So it's a, it's, it is an interesting dynamic. But I think it does it does raise those questions, and I think the questions that Americans need to uh, fully consider. I don't think that uh, the government ought to be looking at uh, internet websites of everybody across the United States. My understanding is, at least based upon what we know so far, it's only international trying to look for international terrorists with regard to internet. The one thing I'd say about the phone records, though, you've never had a privacy right to uh, what phone numbers you've dialed out. Once you dial that number, I think you've, uh, history showed you lost that right for all kind of reasons domestically it's been that case. So I'm not that bothered by the phone records myself as someone who is very concerned about government intrusion. The president has said that uh, Congress approved uh, some of this and there are watchdogs to make sure this information isn't misused. Jennifer, so does that make you feel any better? Well, I mean, they're certainly giving assurances, and, and it's coming from both sides of the aisle. Um, you know, there are top folks from the Bush administration who have come out and, and supported these measures. Uh, you know, Congressman and uh, Senator Lindsey Graham and others have come out and said that this is necessary and, and not to be concerned. Um, you know, but it is, I mean, it is, it's a you know, rattling slope, for a lot of Americans. and. And so they're saying now it's just uh, international, um, but I think there are a lot of people who are worried that maybe that's not the case or what happens tomorrow, you know, when does that change and how will we know? Yeah, I, I, I am. I, I'm, as I said, I'm concerned and I think a lot of people ought to be concerned. It's something that we need to have a, a fuller discussion. I'm always bothered by when government has secrets. Um, some of them are absolutely mm -hmm. necessary for our safety and security. I understand that, but I, I come from the point of view that the, the more informed we are as citizens, the better decisions we'll make as a, as a democratic society. A lot of people feel that way. Uh, let's talk uh, Mike Pence for president. He just became governor. We'll all the talk about him becoming president. But Brian Howey of HowleyPolitics.com has said that uh, uh, his sources are saying that he, and there's a lot of talk out there, that uh, that he's going to he's gonna make a run for it. What do you think about that? I'm not the least bit surprised. I mean, he looked at it uh, when he was number three in Congress, and ultimately, at the same time, Mitch Daniels was looking at the president, and he stepped aside, I think, because he thought Mitch was going to go for it, and also, I think, in part because he thought a big thing was missing from his resume, which was executive experience, so he came back to run for governor. And I think, uh, you know, at the time, in 2012, or 2000, late 2011, when he was looking at it, I think uh, it was probably probably a better time for him to run. He fit, I think, what was the sweet spot of the Republican Party. He was a social conservative and a Tea Party aficionado at the same time. And at that moment, I think that's what the party was looking for. It remains to be seen 2016. It's a long way off, but whether he'll still be in that sweet spot. He, he definitely uh, is uh, the kind of politician that Republicans could get excited about, I think. Is now the right time, Jennifer? I mean, he'll spend more than half of his term as governor, I mean, running for president. Well, I mean, I think he's very focused on, 
on being governor and leading the state and there are lots of things that he wants to do and he's already accomplished a lot just in this first legislative session but he still has time to uh, you know strengthen his record as governor before he has to make any real decisions about whether or not he's running for president I think it's exciting and, and interesting to see if that happens I think we should be proud that our previous governor and our current governor are both potential you know presidential contenders that speaks well of our state we're obviously doing things right um, that would put them in that position but you know as Kip said he's he did consider it before he has a, a strong following across the country conservative groups um, think very highly of him and encouraged him to run last time so you know I don't think it'd be surprising but I do think it's it's too early and I don't think that that's his focus right now I think he's very focused on leading our but state. you think it's legitimate that he would make a run in 2016 I think it's legitimate to consider absolutely I, I, I want to add a few things I think that uh, unfortunately, seconds. unfortunately we've had a string of governors who've been looking uh, past this uh, past their, their current job, which sometimes is good and sometimes is bad. And this time, uh, I think he needed to spend a little bit deeper time understanding what the job of governors, what a governor is, when he vetoed his own administration's bill, uh, Department of Administration, or Department but, of but, but Revenue bill. But he's not bill. the one saying he's looking uh -huh. at running for president. Other people are saying that. Well, you know he's I, doing I think it, he's though. very focused. I, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know that I agree with that statement, I'll say. All right. Well, we have to leave it there, though, for time's sake. But Kip, Jennifer, thanks for coming Thank in you. today. I appreciate Thank it. You. And make sure to stay up to date on political news anytime by following our inside. Laura, Jennifer, Kip, and Abdul on our Capital Watch blog. You can find the link on our webpage, theindychannel.com. Indianapolis This Week continues after the break. This is certainly a day full of sports right here on RTV6. Starting at 1.30 this afternoon, you can catch today's Indianapolis Indians game on RTV6 against the Norfolk Tides at Victory Field. And remember, HTSN is where you can see every Indians home game live this season. And then it's game two of the NBA Finals tonight on RTV6. The San Antonio Spurs are leading the series against the Miami Heat after winning game one. Be sure to catch the Jimmy Kimmel live special starting at 7. Then game two starts at 7.30, followed by RTV6 News at 11 once the game is finished. And that's it for this edition of Indianapolis This Week. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday and the games. I'm Todd Connor. Thanks for joining us.